Great. So I'm very happy that I have the chance to be here and to talk to you. Sorry. Ich entschuldige mich bei allen englischsprachigen Teilnehmern, dass ich jetzt österreichisches Deutsch sprechen werde, weil mein Englisch nicht so gut ist und ich dann noch einiges verbessern muss. Ich switch jetzt also zu Deutsch. A very cordial welcome here to this wonderful conference. I have already been listening and I know that you have provided lots of technical inputs and uh, this is why I would like to keep things a bit more simple, giving you a bit of a break and focusing mainly on what it is all about, and that is soil. But before I really start with soil now, let me give you some good news. We are many, and we're not just many here at this conference, but I and you also are many. So the good news is that despite this individualization that we're experiencing in society, in politics, we have lots of pairs, inhabitants, and you're never alone. So the reason for this is that uh, in our evolution, we have always had partners, tenants, we could say, who have helped us keep up our systems, our blood system, our blood flow, our hormonal systems, and improving them, then also dislocating certain jobs. And all these tenants, whom we cannot see, but who do exist, is what we call a microbiome. This is our largest own system, and that is in the intestines. So in the intestines, we have about 90% 90, 90 of our inhabitants, our tenants, and 10% on the skin, in the hair, etc. So it really is a case that we have more foreign inhabitants than sales of our own. This is so interesting because these tenants often are not taken into account and the way we treat them, also they treat us. So the more different families we have, so starting from bacteria, but also yeats, uh, fungi, etc., the more resilient your immune system is and the healthier you are. So what we know today, what we have known for about 20 or 30 years, we know about the micro, uh, microbiome, which is the hot shit in science. And it provides enormous excellent uh, experiments and tell us how much our inhabitants really impact us, uh, not just our body, but also our thinking, our character, as you can see from our experiments. We will still need to see whether that can then directly also be transposed for humans, but we do have very promising studies showing that the microbiome can even impact our uh, spiritual health, uh, our mental health, and influence certain types of depression and characters. This is very interesting and takes me to the point that what is essential is to feed these silent, quiet inhabitants well, because only if we provide them with a good, stable diet, they all have a chance. As we have seen, uh, indigenous people have up to 50% more microbiome families, so families of bacteria, of different viruses, than we with our nutrition of highly processed foods, of a limited selection. And that that, again, also is a response and does not necessarily benefit us. As a cook, of course, for me, it is very important to say that it is very simple to strengthen your own microbiome by eating uh, lots of different things, fresh food, and that we all live of what is alive. So our food needs to be very much alive, must not be processed so that you can feed our own microbiome and then uh, the microbiome will feed us. 
What is great is that we also have a paradise which shows us the parallelism of natural laws. And that applies to us just like for the rest of the world. When we look at our intestines and then look at what's happening beneath our feet, we can see the same thing. So superorganism, which I would say, is the last paradise on earth that has not been researched very little. And here we do have a very rich and diverse world engaged in permanent exchange, commitment, trying to produce certain vibrations between fungi, between single cell creatures, worms, etc. Some of that you can see with your eyes. Most you don't. But as a matter of fact, we know very little between this interplay of this nature, this phenomenon. And just as we still know very little about this interplay in our intestine, what happens specifically in our intestines, that is a certain restriction through the wrong diet or excessive stress or highly processed foods or very one-sided food, is also happening in the soil. So this variety of the soil, this huge organism that has developed and evolved over thousands of years, which takes up to 500 years to develop a, a, a just two centimeters in our sphere here has got into an imbalance. We do believe that the soil actually is a vessel where you can fill in all sorts of nutrients, uh, nitrogens, uh, calcium, whatever, to feed the plants that grow there. And we've completely forgotten that it is not the nutrients that feed the plant, but it's actually the excrements and the variety of the soil that then also keeps the plants and other inhabitants strong and healthy. Quite the contrary is true. If you add something to the soil without considering the complexity of this life, it will just uh, tip to one side and we need to correct these mistakes. So if we add too many nutrients, too much nitrogen, the plants would grow too fast, but will not have more cells. The cells just become more disruptive and would just fall over at the first blow. And the insects then can uh, go to the juices more easily. What we then do, we just cut the plants and then we're very much astonished when the fungi then penetrate even more quickly because we do have this uh, part missing that makes it difficult for the fungi to proceed. At the same time, we have failed to understand as yet how complex life in the soil really is. You've certainly heard about the fungus that almost all trees and most plants need in order to lead a stable life, and that is mycorrhiza. This is a fungus that has a symbiosis with the tips of the roots and then engages in sort of an exchange with the plants. The fungus sometimes can stretch over hundreds of kilometers and it's sort of a worldwide web for the individual plant, connecting the plant but then also taking out the nutrients, minerals that they cannot manage themselves and in return then uh, passes on the sugar from photosynthesis to the fungi so that that is a win-win um, situation. So life below the soil is so complex and it's one of the last secrets, just as we don't know what's happening in the intestine. Something we do know, however, is that uh, because of evolution through mistakes and uh, trial and error, evolution has come to a point where it has got into a balance where it can achieve the best for us and the best for life in the soil. This is a very old story and we should make sure that when we interfere with these mechanisms, what we really do. Unfortunately, we don't really know what to do most of the time. We only see the damage and then we respond by treating the symptoms, but not correcting the causes. 
I do believe that this is one of the, of the greatest problems. We just spread eco cycles into small bits, and then we try to influence even the small bits and come up with a solution, but forgetting completely that this interference then again causes even more damage in the next member. And that is the cycle of life. I'm not just a chef, and I do believe that this variety on the plates is enormously important, but unfortunately it's declining more and more. As you all know, we have about 92, 92 to 95% of our foods all coming from the soil directly or indirectly. But uh, we have built up a nutrition industry that has greatly restricted this variety of our nutrition, not just because old varieties, old species hardly ever are available to the general public at all, and not at all anymore, but also because a lot is industrialized, monopolized, uh, leveled off, uh, and lots of flavors are just forgotten. But as I said earlier, it is imminently important if you want to stay healthy. We need to have a varied diet, but at the same time also make sure that this variety is preserved in nature, not just on the soil, but also in the soil and in our intestine. The second thing I was just going to say is that I'm not just a chef and a bee breeder and a farmer, but I'm also a member of the European Parliament. Well, I ended up a member pretty much without my own ado. It had never been planned, but it did make sense for me to do so. And that I accepted this position. And I focus on nutrition, on agriculture, I'm in the agricultural uh, council and in on the environmental council. And this is what I'm working on. I try to uh, preserve this variety in nutrition and in agriculture, which also includes animal protection, but also the use of antibiotics. Because as you can imagine, if you take lots of antibiotics, your intestine is pretty much cleared of all the bacteria. It looks as if you had burnt, burnt down the, the rainforest. And this pretty much also happens with the soil. If you just then uh, shed pesticides with this antibiotic effect, you also kill very important microorganisms, which actually have the purpose of keeping the soil and all the microorganisms healthy. In the European Parliament, I'm the shadow reporter of the Farm to Fork strategy. I'm not sure whether you're so familiar with European politics, but let me just give you some explanations so that you are not completely lost. Farm to Fork is a strategy launched by the Commission in 2019, which for the first time ever in European history focuses on the entire food chain, not just farm practices, but also commerce, designations, emissions, animal welfare, the designation of origin, etc., etc. This strategy was used by the European Parliament in the autumn of last year to then also put it to a vote in the plenary and one uh, person of every party that negotiates this strategy and I did that in the environmental council for the Green Party. First, I want to say that it's a great thing that the Commission realized we cannot just take out one um, member of the out of the chain, we need to remember the entire circle, the entire cycle and then make it more fit for the future. The strategy itself has a couple of points that refer to the soil, except for those I have just mentioned. We do recognize that soil protection is eminently important, that we need to monitor the soil, but also that the directive, the suit, the sustainable use of pesticides, needs to be revised. 
that 50% of nutrients are lost and that needs to be changed, that we should use 50% less of antibiotics, not just in pesticides, but also to the cow and the manure, which also then sheds multi-resistant germs into the soil, which is the next big fear I have. <clears throat> but this would be a bigger crisis than COVID because multi-resistant and pan-resistant germs are making quite a headway. Then also, Farm to Fork has another paragraph saying that we need to get away from this dependence of mineral fertilizers and we also need to restrict the use of phosphates and nitrogens and close the loss of nutrients in cycles. And also then, for instance, promote the growing of uh, leguminoses and reward that. This is all part of the strategy as is also the promotional program for school meals, milk and vegetables because and, and to revise it because nowadays of course we say that uh, milk, uh, fruits and vegetables should come fresh from the farms and from um, and should not contain any sugars. So we do have lots of potential in farm to fork which is also why it is the core piece of the Green Deal to achieve a more sustainable transition in agriculture. However, this is all split into individual paragraphs and is all negotiated. And we now have the so-called trilogue where every member of the Commission is doing their negotiations and then the European Parliament takes its own position and proceeds with the negotiations. Individual paragraphs that I have mentioned will still be negotiated during the current term of Parliament but have not yet been so. At the same time, with respect to soil, we also have a soil directive which is imminently important because the Parliament and the Commission so far have not managed to come up with a sustainable directive. This shall happen later in 2023. It is a good thing that they want to have one, but in my party we are a bit concerned because of course there's a will, but we will also see a change. Will this also lead to greater soil protection? Will certain agricultural methods be changed so that we can become more sustainable, more stable? <clears throat> After all, we know that we live of our soil and farmers first and foremost need to keep their own soils fertile uh, so that they will also have an ecological future. But you also know, and I don't want to talk about that now, is that it is very complicated and that today we are the big players in agriculture. So it is not so easy to do good things. And I believe that this is also due to the wrong subsidy system, but it is an opportunity and we need to change something now if we want to have a future at all. If we want to have fresh and healthy food that will not then be polluted if you want to have good water because soil of course also has a very important role for the water and it could make us more resilient for weather extremes that are still uh, coming up a very complex topic but this is so complex mentally and politically as it's our microbiome in our intestines and in our soil we improve on understanding all these connections but we're still far from understanding it all this is why i would like to advise you to orient yourself by nature and not to believe that we'll be the only ones that will, will remain healthy if nature is ill which is why i so much welcome this initiative to engage in networks connecting people making proposals with uh, examples of best practice that go one step further and also encourage us to go on it can uh, we can manage it and we will manage it and now i will be happy to answer questions and i hope that i can answer them
Thank you very much, Sarah, um, for your talk. And we. Yeah, well, I, yes, I have no response. I don't know how to interpret that now, so I just keep waiting. Good. So I don't want to keep you bored in front of your computer and this is why I would now like to mention an important regulation that is just being negotiated by the Commission, that is SIA. We're not getting a message. Good. I just hear that I cannot hear the motivation, which makes things a bit difficult for me. Maybe you can write me in the chat whether I should go on or just shut up. As I've heard, there are no questions so far, which will, will now impact the subsidy system. How strong are the digital lobbies? When we need to say that the agricultural lobby, of course, is uh, one of the oldest in the European Union, and of course, it has a very strong say. For me, as a naive neo politician, I must say that this causes me quite a lot of worry because there are some strategies where even the European a farmers uh, federation then impacts uh, MPs, prepares questions that are then asked in a very specific way so that they can push ahead the changes or come up with a strategy to boycott farm to fork so that no one will vote in its favor because the European farmers federation does not want to have any binding reduction goals. So strategies, yes, we understand we need to become more sustainable, but we don't want to have any uh, consequences. I don't think that this is very uh, good for the future and it is short-term thinking because if we as farmers, and I am also a farmer, and also conventional farmers, do not honor that we urgently need to transform the future that is already um, knocking on our doors and wants to come in is just a fertile surrogate such as in vitro meat where we then say well it's great we no longer need any farmers we no longer need any animals we don't need to protect nature because we now have food from the 3d printer or surrogates pretending to be meat and fish so therefore it is simply necessary to remember all this and change it for the good of all of us. Subsidies, of course, here we mainly refer to the CAP, the uh, Common Agricultural Policy. Let me give you just one example. I don't know how well versed you are in EU politics. Uh, have you forgive me, but I don't want to leave anyone out. Nowadays, mainly um, the areas are subsidies. So if you have a lot, you get lots of subsidies, no matter how you treat your soil, no matter how you treat your animals. And this is something you need to stop. According to the principle that what is good needs to be rewarded and what is bad needs to be undone. At present, we say, well, there is a lot of negative stuff, but we reward what is less than negative. I believe we need to be more radical. We need to reward what is good and not support what is bad. And then another question, are there studies showing that uh, you get healthier food from healthy soils and where? I've just done a position paper, the quality of food conventional versus organic. There's a very new study on microbiomes in and on apples, and it showed that it is much more variable on organic apples than in conventional apples, and that, again, is very important for your own microbiome and the microbiome in nature. This is one thing. 
But then, I don't need to say, if you have a lot of nitrogen on vegetables, of course, you will have more water that stores up and the taste and flavor will also change and also flavor what you feed animals with. We know that even with eggs. And so you do have <coughs> subjective parameters, but you also have clear evidence and studies that organic milk has more omega-3 fatty acids. And so we do have scientific studies showing that organic food very often provides higher quality. I'm happy to provide you with my position paper, if you wish. If just write to my office at the European Parliament, and uh, we will then keep discussing this further by email or whatever. So, now we need, I need to uh, check what's coming next. Well, good. It says that the session will be over in a minute. If you have further questions, please just uh, write to my office at the European Parliament. I wish you a very successful conference. Thank you for listening. And I hope that I've managed to give you a bit of a break from all the technical details waiting for you, or maybe not. And I wish you a good end of the week.